Open your Bibles with me to Judges chapter 7. And uh, I, uh, I want to kind of continue a message that I started last week. The Holy Spirit's just been speaking to me through these scriptures in the life of Gideon. And I want to read a piece of the story. I'm going to pick up some of the other story around this as I go. But I'm in Judges 7. I want to begin in verse 1. Early in the morning, Jeroboam, that is Gideon, and all his men camped at the spring of Herod. The camp of Midian was north of them in the valley near the hill of Morah. The Lord said to Gideon, You have too many men for me to deliver Midian into their hands, in order that Israel may not boast against me that her own strength has saved her, Announce now to the people, anyone who trembles with fear may turn back and leave Mount Gilead. So, 22,000 men left while 10,000 remained. I want to remind you that the Bible describes these Midianites as being so numerous that you can't even count their camels. And it would be like counting the sand on the seashore. Gideon starts with 32,000 men, and just like that, he's down to 10,000. Verse 4, but the Lord said to Gideon, there are still too many men. Take them down to the water, and I will sift them for you. That's how my translation reads. I want you to get a hold of that word. I will sift them for you. There. There. If I say this one shall go with you, he shall go. But if I say this one shall not go with you, he shall not go. So Gideon took the men down to the water and there the Lord told him, separate those who lap the water with their tongues like a dog from those who kneel down to drink. 300 men lapped with their hands to their mouth to their mouths. All the rest got down on their knees to drink. The Lord said to Gideon, with the 300 men that lapped, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hands. Let all the other men go each to his own place. So Gideon sent the rest of the Israelites to their tents, but kept the 300 who took over the provisions and trumpets of the others. Now the camp of Midian lay below him in the valley. <clears throat> During that night, the Lord said to Gideon, get up, and go down against the camp because I am going to give it into your hands. Um, last week, I, I, we looked together at sort of the first part of Judges chapter 6, and I preached a message called Gideon's Wine Press. And today I want to talk to you about Gideon's War. Father, bless the reading of your word. I pray, God, that you will open our hearts to receive what your word and your spirit would say to the church. And let your word not return void, but I pray that you will change all who hear this message. And it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Last week's message on Gideon's wine press was the story of Gideon hiding down in the wine press as he was trying to thresh wheat. And he's in that pit <clears throat> hiding from the Midianites who for seven years had been invading the land and ruining their crops. And there were so many, many Midianites that it says that it was, this is chapter 6, verse 5, it was impossible to count the men and their camels, and they invaded the land to ravage it. 
And if you didn't get to see that message or if you weren't able to be here, uh, watch our program from last week and put these two messages together. So Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press, hiding in fear of the Midianites. And I told you last week that there may be a part two of that message because God was just, it seemed like he was just really speaking to my heart the past several days about uh, this passage of scripture, about the life of Gideon and how God worked in his life. And so today I'm talking to you about Gideon's war. As you probably know, Gideon is one of the judges or rulers that God raised up to deliver his people uh, from the oppression of their enemies. And unlike other leaders in the Bible, when you know these judges came along, these judges were not born judges. They were not born rulers. I mean, you understand that in the Bible, kings were born to be kings as the son of a king. Or priests were born priests. Levites were born Levites. But Gideon was not born a judge. He was called by God to do this. It was a calling on his life. He didn't, he didn't get to be one of the judges because he was the best candidate for the job either. God simply chose him and called him to deliver his people from the hand of the Midianites. Gideon didn't take this job because he felt like he could do it. In fact, if you remember from last week, Gideon argued with God about why he couldn't do it. The Lord spoke to Gideon and said, well, you mighty warrior. And Gideon was kind of like, are you talking to me? Remember, he, you know, remember that God sees you different than you see you. I think somebody just needed that. God sees you different than you see you. Gideon didn't feel like a mighty warrior when the Lord referred to him as a mighty warrior. Gideon felt quite inadequate to the task God was calling him to. But you know, God will never ask you to do something you can't do. And I want you to know that what God did for Gideon, he'll do for you. He'll help you through your greatest fears and he'll give you your greatest victory. Even when you feel inadequate, even when you feel like I can't do this, God is good at doing what you feel like you can't do. Let me kind of open up this message by talking about Gideon's fear. Before Gideon could ever face the war with Midian, he first had to deal with an even greater war. And it was a war inside of himself. The real war and the greatest war that Gideon faced was not the physical war that he faced with the Midianites. It was the war that was playing out really on the battlefield of his mind. And that is often the case with us. There is an enemy that seeks every day to harm God's people. But the greatest war is usually the one we deal with on the inside. And so before he could go to war with the Midianites, he first had to fight the war of fear on the inside. And to be very plain with you, Gideon was a man of fear. I've heard a lot of preachers preach sermons on fear, and usually they're quite scathing. Usually they, they will tell you that fear is a sin, and they will almost condemn you as a sinner because you're afraid. Why wouldn't you be afraid 
if the circumstances that you find yourself in are fearful, I just want to say that God has, God created you and gave you your emotions and fear is one of your emotions that God gave you. Listen, fear can be a good thing. Fear can save your life. I mean, Gideon's a man of fear and why not? I mean, given the circumstances of his life, we've already seen in the first part of chapter six how he was hiding in the wine press in fear. But let me give you an even clearer picture of Gideon's fear. And for this, I want you to go back to chapter six for a moment and just glance with me starting around verse 24, which is kind of where I left off last week. It is in chapter six, verse 24, that we see that Gideon has just built an altar to the Lord and called it the Lord is peace. Do you remember this? But notice that it was later that same night the Lord spoke to Gideon and told him to take the second bull from your father's herd, tear down your father's altar to Baal and cut down the Asherah pole beside it. And then he said, build a proper kind of altar to the Lord your God on the top of this height. And he said, using the wood of the Asherah pole, that you cut down, offer the second bull as a burnt offering. Now in verse 24, Gideon had just built an altar and offered an offering to the Lord. So why would God ask him to do that again later that same night? Well, the truth is the first time Gideon did this, it was just between him and God. Nobody else saw Gideon's devotion to God. And so God was addressing the real war Gideon was facing, and that was that war on the inside. It was a war of fear. Verse 27, if you'll notice, it says, So Gideon took ten of his servants and did as the Lord told him. And pay close attention to this. But because he was afraid of his family and the men of the town, he did it at night rather than in the daytime. In the morning, when the men of the town got up, there was Baal's altar demolished with the Asherah pole beside it, cut down, and the second bull sacrificed on the newly built altar. And they asked each other, who did this? And when they carefully investigated, they were told Gideon, son of Joash, did it. So the men of the town demanded of Joash, bring out your son, he must die because he has broken down Baal's altar and cut down the Asherah pole beside it. So you see, Gideon was afraid of his own family and all the men of the town who were living an ungodly life. They were not living for the Lord. They were living a life of idolatry and rebellion to the God of heaven and earth. And Gideon had just had an encounter with the Lord as he was sitting under Gideon's oak tree watching Gideon thresh wheat in a wine press. And Gideon had built an altar to the Lord and called it the Lord is peace in one of the most unpeaceful times. But because he was afraid of his own family and afraid of his own people, he had built that first altar in a secret place. And he worshiped the Lord in secret where nobody could see him do it. But before he was ready to go to war with the Midianites, he first had to fight the war of fear. Before he could fight the war that it was seen, he first had to fight the war that was unseen. So God said, build another altar, but first I want you to tear down the altar of Baal. You see, you first have to fight your spiritual battles before you concern yourself with anything else. See, we get this backwards in life. We want to fight the battles of, you know, who we want to date or who we want to marry or what job we're supposed to have or if I can get a better job or if I can make my life better somehow. And God says, no, first tear down the altar to Baal and then build a proper altar to me. 
you first have to fight your spiritual battles before you can ever expect to win the physical war. He said, tear down that Asherah pole, use it for wood to offer this burnt offering to the Lord. And God was in essence saying, Gideon, I want all the people and I want all of your family to see what you've done. God's message to you, Gideon, is this. Don't you ever be afraid to live your faith in front of your family who's not living for the Lord. I think I feel the Holy Spirit right there. Don't ever let your fear cause you to hide your faith. God's not criticizing you for your fear, Gideon. But he is challenging your fear. Don't be afraid to let your family see your faith. They may criticize you. They may ridicule you. I mean, these people came out to kill Gideon for what he had done. Your family and some of your friends may hate your faith, but don't be afraid to build your altar where they can see your faith. I mean, I appreciate the fact, Gideon, that you built an altar of peace in chapter 6, verse 24, but to really do this the right way, you first have to tear down your father's altar to Baal because you cannot have two altars in your life. There's no room for that in your faith, Gideon. God won't ever be content for you to simply place your faith alongside faith in Baal. God was challenging Gideon to draw a very hard line in the sand because you see, Gideon, I want you to tear down the altar to Baal so you can build a proper kind of altar to the Lord your God. Your friends and your family need to see your faith without compromise. They need to see your faith is without fear. Don't ever be afraid to display your faith to those around you who aren't living for the Lord. Don't hide your faith in fear around your family. Don't be afraid to be a man or a woman of God at work. Don't be afraid to be a person of faith at school. You see, when they came to Joash, Gideon's dad, demanding that he bring out Gideon so they could kill him, the Bible says something interesting about Joash. This is a man who had a, an altar to Baal. But now listen to what he says. Joash replied to the hostile crowd around him, are you going to plead Baal's cause? Are you trying to save him? Whoever fights for him shall be put to death by morning. Now listen, he said, if Baal really is God, he can defend himself when someone breaks down his altar. Oh, oh, I think I see a change in Joash's heart. A man who used to have an altar to Baal, but because of Gideon's faith, his dad had a change of heart. And he said, if Baal really is God, he can defend himself. Do you, do you want to see what, what real revival looks like? I believe when Gideon heard what his father had said, Gideon heard the implied promise of the one true living God in his father's words. His father said, if Baal is really a God, he can defend himself. But implied in that statement is the implied promise of the one true living God that Gideon, you need to know that I, the true and living God, can fight my own battles. And the war that you are facing with the Midianites is not your war. It is mine. And Baal cannot fight any battles because Baal is not a real God. But I can fight every battle that you will ever face because I am God and besides me there is none other. And when Joash responded to Gideon's faith and when Gideon got a hold of the implied promise of God, the story goes on in chapter 6 to tell us, Then the Spirit of the Lord came on Gideon, and he blew a trumpet, summoning the Abiasrites to follow him, and he sent messengers throughout Manasseh, calling them to arms. Do you see a change in his fear? 
Now, let me talk to you, secondly, about God's sifting. Last week, we saw how the Lord agreed to wait on Gideon. Do you remember this? Gideon said, wait here. I want to go prepare an offering, a sacrifice. And he said, I will wait on you. And I don't know if you remember, maybe I, I, hope I've made, I hope I did it well, but I tried to convey to you how incredible that God is patient with us. That he waits on us. It's just incredible to think that God will wait on us when we're struggling with our faith. And now even after he called his people to arms, we still see some fear in Gideon's heart. At the end of chapter 6 is a well-known passage of Scripture about Gideon's fleece of wool that he places before the Lord. Where Gideon questions God's promise of victory and God confirms his promise to Gideon not once but twice. But what happens next is mind-blowing. Here Gideon is in the passage that I read to open my message with in chapter 7. Here Gideon is still struggling with his fear. Lord, if you're really going to give me victory, I want to put this fleece out. And God answered his prayer and he said, okay, let me kind of reverse that and still put a fleece out and let's get this confirmed one more time. He's still struggling with his fear and God does something that makes the situation even more fearful. Although he is facing an army that is so vast that it says their camels could no more be counted than the sand on the seashore. That's chapter 7, verse 12. And Gideon only has 32,000 men. But God said, you have too many men for me to deliver Midian into your hands. So God began to systematically dismantle Gideon's army. So he tells Gideon to send, some, send home all the men who are trembling in fear. I've got to be honest with you. I probably would have gone home with that first group. So God whittles down the number and Gideon looks around and says, well, let's see. I've still got 22,000 who left. I've still got 10,000 who remained. God says, Gideon, there are still too many men, so take them down to the water and I will sift them there for you until Gideon is left with just 300 men against this vast army. Let me ask you a question. Has God ever sifted your life like he has mine? I mean, you've, you've already been through so much. You, you already feel like you're not going to make it. You already feel inadequate to the task that lies in front of you. You feel like you're facing a mountain that you cannot climb, a river that you cannot cross, or a war that you cannot possibly win. And at that very season of your life, has God ever sifted you? Has God ever systematically dismantled your life? Have you ever felt like God is just removing what little you have left? If you have ever wondered why God would sift your life, pay close attention to what I'm about to say. When God had called Gideon, Gideon had said, well, how can I possibly save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. And besides that, he said, if the Lord is with me, why has all this happened to me? The Lord has abandoned me, Gideon said. And even with 32,000 men, Gideon was still outnumbered by an army like the sand on the seashore. Now God has sifted Gideon's army down to just 300 men for two reasons. One, 
in order that Israel may not boast that her own strength has saved her. And two, God was about to teach Gideon something very important about winning his war. And he wants to teach this to you too. In chapter 7, verse 10, I didn't read this in my text, but I want you to go there and I want you to look at it. God said, if you're still afraid. Now, now I, I read this. I, I read that and I think, if I'm still afraid, God, are you kidding me? I'm, I mean, you, you've sifted me. I was afraid when I had 32,000. You've taken a frightening situation and made it even more frightening. Why would God do that to you, Gideon? Why does God sift you and make the situation look even more fearful than it already was? Now, follow me at verse 10. If you are afraid to attack, go down to the camp of the Midianites and listen to what they're saying. And God said afterward, after you hear what the enemy is saying about you, you will be encouraged to attack the camp. So Gideon and a servant of his named Pura went down to the outposts of the Midianite camp and they got there, the Bible says, just as a man was telling a friend his dream. And he said, I had a dream. And his friend says, well, what was it about? He said, a round loaf of barley bread came tumbling into the Midianite camp. It struck the tent with such a force that the tent overturned and collapsed. Look at verse 14. His friend responded, this can be nothing other than the sword of Gideon, son of Joash, the Israelite. God has given the Midianites and the whole camp into his hands. Now listen, if you have ever felt like you were the least and the weakest, like Gideon, and if you've ever struggled with fear like Gideon, and if God has ever sifted you and systematically dismantled your life leaving you with nothing with which to fight your battle. If you are still afraid, then God would say to you today, if only you could hear what they're saying about you in the enemy's camp. You may feel like you have nothing with which to fight this war, but I've got news for somebody today. They're talking about you in hell. Oh, if, if only you could hear what they're saying about you in hell today. It's not, it's not about what family you come from, Gideon. And it's not about the size of your army. It's about the God that you serve. It's about the God who called you. They fear him in hell. And you need to understand something, child of God. When the demons of hell watch God start to sift your life, taking away the things that you've depended on in the past, when they watch God sift you, the demons in hell tremble in fear because they know something is going on. They know that this war is no longer Gideon's war, but it is God's war. For God has given the whole camp into Gideon's hand. Are you hearing me this morning? Man, I said you're, you're being talked about in hell. I, they, they fear your faith in hell. In the earthly realm, it may look like you're facing an impossible war to win. You may be struggling with fear. But in the spirit realm, demons know your name. If you, if you can only go down to the enemy's camp and hear what they're saying about you. And when you get a hold of this truth, you can do what Gideon did. It says when Gideon heard the dream and its interpretation, he worshiped God. Hallelujah. Now, that's, that's how you fight your battles. <laughs> I, I will worship you, God, not just in the sanctuary, but I'll worship you in the enemy's camp. I'll worship you to win my war. I want the demons of hell to know the name Todd Steffi. 
And when they talk about me in hell, I want them to know that I serve the living God. And when God begins to sift my life and take away the things I think I need to get through this next war, I want the demons to understand that's because God's got a plan that they cannot defeat. Let me talk about Gideon's victory. The story of how Gideon's war was won is a lesson on how we will win our own wars. The Bible says, dividing the 300 men into three companies, he, Gideon, placed trumpets and empty jars in the hands of all of them with torches inside. Here's what he said. Watch me, he told them. Follow my lead. When I get to the edge of the camp, do exactly as I do. And so 300 companies of 100 men went down to the Midianite camp. And it says Gideon and the 100 men with him reached the edge of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch, just after they had changed the guard. They blew their trumpets and broke the jars that were in their hands. The three companies blew the trumpets and smashed the jars, grasping the torches in their left hands and holding in their right hands the trumpets they were to blow. They shouted, a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. Do you get that picture? They don't even have a sword in their hand. They have jars that they break with lights inside of them, a candle or something, and a trumpet that they blow and begin to shout a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. Now, I don't have quite enough time to develop this, but at least let me lay it out for you. Gideon and his men did three things to win this war that you need to do in order to win your war. I want to show you the symbolism, if I can, just real quickly in these three things, if you want to win your war. First, they blew trumpets. Trumpets were used as a call to battle. But in Scripture, in God's battles, they were not just a call to battle, they were a call to victory. What do you mean, Pastor? Well, later, you know, God's people later came against the city of Jericho, and it was the seven priests who carried trumpets before the Lord, and they blew those trumpets as a call to victory as the walls came down. Do you understand in the New Testament, we see that it is the blast of the trumpet of the Lord that will call us home to our ultimate victory. And secondly, they broke the jars with the torches inside. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7 says, For God, who said, Let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay, so that this all-surpassing knowledge is from God and not from us. Do you understand the, the Bible says that the Lord is close to the broken-hearted? And that he saves those who are crushed in spirit. One thing I know is that God can use broken vessels. In fact, he can win wars with them. And thirdly, in verse 20, it says, They shouted a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. You can shout because of whose war it is. It's not just the sword of Gideon. It's the sword of the Lord that fights Gideon's war. And that's all they did. They blew trumpets, they broke jars, and they shouted. And the Bible says, when the 300 trumpets sounded, the Lord caused the men throughout the camp to turn on each other with their swords, and the army fled. I am so thankful for God's patience with me when I feel inadequate and when I feel afraid. 
I'm so thankful that he understands my fear and that he so patiently and tenderly deals with my fear and encourages me. I'm so thankful for the sifting. I'm so glad that God sometimes just systematically sifts out of my life the things that I thought I needed. I am so glad I am talked about in hell. I'm so thankful that the enemy of my soul knows my name and he knows the God that I serve and I'm glad that demons in hell tremble because of that and he will do that for you. And so the invitation is tear down Baal's altar and live your faith in front of those who hate you. Build a proper altar right in front of those who will criticize you for it. And let God sift you. It may feel like he's taking your life apart piece by piece, but let him sift your life. There is an enemy that wars for your soul, but God wants you to learn to worship him in the war. And that old devil can bring you a lot of fear while living in this world, but God will put the fear of you into the heart of your enemy. And I just want to tell someone, if you could only hear what they are saying about you in hell, your heart would be encouraged. God will never ask you to do something you cannot do. And I want you to know that what God did for Gideon, he'll do for you. He'll help you through your greatest fears and give you your greatest victory and he will use your brokenness to win the war. And that's what we learn from Gideon's war. Thank you, God. How many of you feel like you've been sifted before? Yeah. Would you stand with me? I invite you to build a proper altar to the Lord and know that they talk about you in hell and they're afraid of you down there because they're afraid of the Lord who lives in your heart. They're afraid of God who is your Father and who lives in your heart if you're a believer in Jesus. If you're not a believer in Jesus and you're watching our program, I invite you to invite Jesus Christ into your heart because He will save you and He will help you through any battle in life that you will ever face. Because Gideon, this is not your war. Baal can't fight a battle. I can fight my own, God says. Amen? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, I thank you this morning for your word. I thank you for teaching us. I thank you for speaking to hearts of men and women who hear this message. I pray, God, for the multitude. I pray that you will draw men and women and young men and women, boys and girls, to you through your word. Let your word not return void. Those, God, who may be going through a battle and they feel like you've just sifted their life, I pray that you will help them understand the sifting today. And I pray that the demons in hell will be afraid of your servants who walk the face of this earth in the power of your might. And Lord, we give you all praise and all glory. Bless these people now. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said amen.